you being the mold medic, I would love to know exactly how you got into this field of work. Yeah, I mean, most kids don't dream of becoming a mold guy when they grow up. And, you know, it, was, it definitely wasn't my dream. But um, essentially, my dad's a, been a contractor my entire life. So pretty much second generation contractor in the family. And why I got into mold specifically or environmental exposure really is, is Hurricane Sandy that happened in the Northeast when I was where I'm originally from. And seeing people actually sick due to these types of exposures is really what made me dial into this. And mainly because I, I saw an interest in, you know, looking at people who were being sick, coming from a background that I came from, I almost didn't believe it at first. I was like, wait, what do you mean people are sick? Like, it's just mold, right? You know, you know, mold can't make you sick or, you know, bacteria and these things. I mean, you know, it, I used to lick poles as a kid or something and never had problems, right? So you start looking at this and you start to see kind of these limiting beliefs that you, you know, come, that come into play just, just of a lack of awareness. And when I started seeing people get sick, a light bulb turned on in my head in terms of like, okay, I think there's something that we're missing here from a societal standpoint. And so I started getting into mold remediation and um, I started, I got my certification. Later, the state became licensed. I got my license and I really just dove in head first. And I, I came across things like mycotoxins and which is a toxic byproduct that mold can create and a lot of other bacterial exposures and bacterial toxins. And I, as I started really diving into this and watching the transformation of people not feeling well, then all of a sudden they start feeling better. Um, it, was, it was really a big eye opener for me and it kind of made me feel like I was in the right place. Welcome to A Healthy Bite. You're one nibble closer to a more satisfying way of life, a healthier you and bite-sized bits of healthy motivation. Now let's dig in on the dish with Rebecca Huff. I guess a lot of people who have flood damage from hurricanes need mold remediation. Is there a way to prevent mold or is it just inevitable that there's going to be mold if there's been a hurricane? Well, I guess the way to prevent mold would be a little bit different than, than hurricane for preparation because, right. you know, unfortunately, you know, what mother nature kind of dictates whether your house is going to have water intrusion or not. I think there's really no way to prevent against that. Mm -hmm. Obviously there's certain products they make now that are like hurricane rated and things like that, or that are, you know, tested against heavy winds and, and, mm -hmm. and wind driven rains, but essentially, you know, you have to deal with it as it comes. So if you we have water intrusion that comes into the house, dealing with it properly would, would actually make sure that, you know, you keep mold away because Mold can grow in as quickly as 24 to 48 hours. So if you have a hurricane hit and someone doesn't come for a month later, you're at a disadvantage there. Mm -hmm. I think also making sure you have proper insurance coverage is key. You'd rather, you'd rather have it if you need it than not have it if you need it. You know, and I think right. that's kind of the, the, the adage that I like to go to because unfortunately for a lot of people, when I come to their house and something bad had happened, you know, they may not have enough coverage to deal with everything properly. And I think that's what, that's where people are kind of forced to cut corners. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately you're sacrificing your health when you cut corners with regards to environmental exposures. Mm -hmm. That is certainly a good point is the insurance. I know I've been there. We had uh, mold remediation done years and years ago in a different house and our insurance didn't cover it. So it's yeah. definitely something to think about, but the thing is, and I want to back up a little bit because I think a lot of people just, it's not some big event like a hurricane or a flood or something that causes them to have mold in their house. A lot of people just don't even realize it's there until they get sick. So yeah. can you tell us in your experience, obviously it is possible, but to have mold exposure and mold toxicity without being aware of, or having ever seen it in your environment. Yeah, actually that's kind of a scary thing is I would say most people that I visit with on the surface, the house looks fine. They, you don't even really see mold. You may get like some weird odors or things like that. That can be other signals to detect if you have mold. But, you know, there's, th it seems fine, right? The place is clean. You don't really see a lot of signs of water damage. It's, it's really behind the wall where the problem is. And that can make it a lot, you know, more, that can make it much more difficult to detect. And that's why I kind of look at environmental exposure as a whole, because I would say that if you look at really any medical journal, you're going to find out the three common 
themes of illness or genetics, predispositions, and then environmental exposures. And so my job, and part of the reason why I wrote the Mold Medic is, you know, this isn't a problem that you fix house by house. This is a problem that you fix fundamentally by creating that awareness around environmental exposures and how that impacts our health. You know, there's, when you go to a doctor and you get diagnostics done, there's typically baskets, right, that they put people in and there's, they're called classifications. Essentially, it's like if, if you have these four symptoms, you have this particular disease or this particular diagnosis, right? And so what they don't, what they don't tell you is typically how those diagnoses come about. What is the actual cause? And so for a lot of things that we experience in Western medicine in general, they're dealing with environmental exposures. And it's just something that we're not really cognizant of. And I think that's part of the problem. So when I look at if you have some sort of illness and you're going doctor to doctor and no one's really figuring it out and you get your blood work looks good and there's no real like understanding or reason behind it, I would say immediately start looking at environmental exposures because it's typically, that's typically what I see people go through. Mm -hmm. So two questions. One, what are some of the symptoms of mold exposure? And two, can a family that lives in the same house have one person that has symptoms of mold exposure while other people in the family don't? And then to expound on that, if I'm thinking the answer is yes, if so, why does that happen? Okay. So yes, you're correct. The answer is yes. Basically how this works is everybody has their own, you know, immune systems and their own, let's call them toxicity levels, right? You have thresholds. Certain people are going to reach those thresholds faster than others. And there's so many variables, right? So for instance, if the husband or wife is getting it, let's say, and they're not feeling well, it could be because when they were a kid, they were exposed to environmental exposures that kind of are, that helped them reach that threshold sooner than the other person. So at that point, they're, they haven't, they're having these exposures. They're starting to just, it just gets triggered. It gets exacerbated. And essentially they start feeling these effects way worse than, than some of the other people. I, I notice usually in a family of four, it's usually one of four or two of the four that are you know not feeling well. And the other two are typically fine, which can make things a little difficult in terms of just getting that support system that you need. It's hard to it's hard to support someone around something you, you haven't experienced yourself, you know? And I think that's just part of human nature, essentially. What are the symptoms? They range. I would say the biggest complaints that I hear of are brain fog, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. You have eczema, skin rashes, hives, etc. You have definitely cognitive impairment on top of the brain fog where, you know, you're, it, it's not just like you're taking longer to come up with thoughts, like you're losing trains of thought entirely. I'll have clients where I'm on the phone with and I'm asking them questions and, and like just mid stride, they've completely forgot what they were talking about or where they were. And we, you know, we just obviously have the patience to kind of talk things through and, and get them back on track. You know, it, it's really, it's really sad and scary stuff. A lot of the other things are respiratory infection, respiratory disease. Uh, you have basically the onset of a cold that never quite goes, goes away these allergy-like symptoms. And what's interesting about allergy is just the word allergy in itself. It talks about, uh, if you define that word, that any foreign substance entering the body that causes an adverse reaction is considered an allergy. So, you know, that, that really kind of explains things when you break it down, like why certain people maybe have these allergy-like reactions when there's high levels of pollen in the air, but also mold. And Whenever people change their HVAC seasons, like from heating to cool, cooling and from cooling to heating, you know, you'll tend to notice that these allergy-like reactions can trigger. And that's actually the system's changing over and it's impacting the mold in a specific way that's, you know, cr pushing it through more, getting it into your breathing zone, you're breathing that in and it's causing these reactions. So it, it's, it's very interesting kind of the different symptoms that people experience. And they all seem so like many other things, which makes it a lot harder to pinpoint. Is it, you know, environmental exposures that's making you sick? Mm -hmm. Do children have different symptoms than adults? So a lot of the symptoms that I've seen in children is, you know, the, the development of asthma. There's a lot of studies regarding, you know, autism and being on the spectrum due to the development 
the, the developmental factors, mm -hmm. you know, cause you're having your immune system, if it's constantly under attack due to environmental exposures at the exact time that you're trying to, your body's trying to develop its fine motor skills, its cognitive development, it can really slow down that path and, and make things more difficult. So I've seen, I've seen, I've seen some remarkable things in children in terms of development after they've been out of, you know, environmental exposure situations, like when they improve their air quality and got into a better situation mm -hmm. that the children starting to get better wow. and show a lot of, a lot of remarkable improvement. Mm -hmm. And just briefly, what about pets? Like if you have an indoor dog or cat, is there usually an effect on them? Yeah, I mean, there's there's been there's been a lot of FDA actually uh, regulates the level of mycotoxins in our food, and that's for not only humans and animals because the studies that have been done show that mycotoxin exposure to to, to humans or animals is not great, mm -hmm. and uh, you know obviously it can cause sickness in our pets as well. So it's interesting how they set those exposure limits in the the agriculture industry, but they're not talking about it or educating people within the home. And mold can grow in the home and it can produce mycotoxins inside the home that can enter our bodies and our pets' bodies too. So I think it's equally as important to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And then a step further, those are some of the symptoms that people might see or have in their self or their child or maybe a pet. But what about the long-term effects, particularly if someone maybe is exposed to mold over a long, long period of time without knowing and without ever being diagnosed, what, what kind of long-term effects can you see? Well, I, I've seen some very interesting long-term effects in terms of sensitivities, how the body adapts and changes. I look at it as a way of when your body is kind of, when your body kind of evolves and knows that certain things are harmful it starts to become much more heightened sensitivity to these things because it's trying to get on this pathway to heal. That's what I've started to notice because I'll have people who after long-term exposure to mold and talking to them and understanding their history and, and under all that, you'll see that they started to develop what's called multiple chemical sensitivity, mast cell activation syndrome, where they're now sensitive to light and sound. You have all these like heightened sensitivities that start to occur. And then obviously they're not feeling well around certain things. I had a woman that I, I will never forget because I rang her doorbell. She immediately asked me if I had a phone on me, which I told her I did. She said, please leave it in the car because the, the, the radio frequencies of the phone actually like caused me to have like severe reactions. So there's no problem. So I left the phone in there and upon looking at her house, she had some, some pretty you know, alarming levels of mold based upon the mold report. You could see that there was visual signs of it and she had, you know, no microwave, the slot for the microwave was completely missing. She told me that she had to throw out the microwave because she would have reactions whenever someone used the microwave. I mean, literally like her skin would turn red and the whole family saw it. So it wasn't like this, this mystical thing. It really happened. And so I was just blown away because I, I never had imagined at that point or before that point that it could get that bad, but mm -hmm. I, I've seen some pretty severe cases. Wow. So what kind of treatments are available and are they different between say like conventional medicine and functional medicine? Sure. So I would say that the treatments are available are kind of a two part process. One, you want to actually remove yourself from the exposure. So if you have a, you know, if you have a pretty severe mold problem in your house and you've identified that you want to actually remediate that before you come back there, a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll kind of move out of that environment, start undergoing treatments schedule remediation to be done. And then when it's done, they'll have, you know, this safe place to come back into that. I've noticed a lot of people doing that. And as far as the treatments go, yeah, I mean, essentially you have inflammation that typically happens. So your, your body kind of as a self-defense mechanism, it tends to start holding on to water weight to dilute the toxicity. It starts to insulate the organs, which is what we can consider chronic inflammation. And it, it does these things basically as a, just a natural defense mechanism to fight against the toxicity. And so you have to really help your body detoxify for those symptoms to start to subside. Cause those symptoms, again, you know, we would never know that we're sick or we're hurt if we didn't have a, a, a reaction, right? You cut your arm, your arm starts to hurt, right? And it's, it's really our, our body's way of telling us, Hey, there is a problem here. You need, you need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. So the only way to start feeling better is to really rid your body of these toxins, of these exposures so that you can begin to start to heal again. And that's what people consider detoxifying. 
Right. Okay. And so like do the methods of detoxifying, I mean, is there a conventional treatment and because I've used some functional medicine therapy for detoxing mold and I've never actually looked into or questioned anyone about conventional treatment, do doctors acknowledge that this exists and what kind of treatments do they use for it? Or is it something that they kind of, kind of like, you know, adrenal fatigue or something that they don't really think it exists? You know, I, I wouldn't say that. I don't think doctors think it exists. I think the doctors and Western, the typical conventional Western medicine doctors, I think they're not connecting the dots. I mean, it, everyone knows about environmental exposures, right? We talk about outdoor air pollution and how smog impacts us, right? We're, we have, we have, entire programs built around changing the, the pollution that we emit outside. But we don't talk about how that same types of pollution can impact us inside. And that's typically you're, you're going to have bacteria, you're going to have VOCs, formaldehyde, mold, and then the toxins released by both on top of the allergens and everything else that are already part of our system. So we don't talk much about that and how that impacts our health. And I think that's why a lot of people aren't connecting to the information really hasn't been furnished in a way that's easy to understand. We have 118 published medical journals that are that live and die on the NIH website that never get used to educate others. So I think you know there's a there's a there's just a when I look at like environmental health, right? I feel like we're at an infancy stage. I think as we continue to do good work, myself and others that that are out there advocating for this change, I think over time you're going to start to see that transform. Believe it or not, I mean, you know, I would say most conventional uh, doctors who this pops up on their radar, they're probably going to prescribe you to antifungals, just like a functional medicine doctor would. And, you know, they're, they're definitely going to refer you to other specialists too. Like I've seen people go from like, you know, antifungals with a conventional doctor, and they also get recommended to go see like an ear, throat, nose doctor, allergist specialist. And, you know, they just kind of they kind of whip together different treatment programs based upon what you're going through and what your symptoms are. But the reason why I love functional medicine over Western medicine, in, in all honesty, is because you're looking at what's the root cause, right, that, that allows these symptoms to happen. Because again, as I referenced before, symptoms really are, is really our body's way of alerting us to there being a problem so we can do something about it. What's causing that symptom in the first place? And I think functional medicine does a really good job at trying to identify that and, mm -hmm. you know, work on treatment programs to fix that. Whereas a lot of Western medicine, as we know, it's like, okay, if you have symptom A, take pill B, right? <laughs> and it's, it's just kind of how it goes. So that, that's, that, that's my two cents on the medical field. I'm not a doctor. Definitely find a doctor that you like and work closely with, and that actually mm -hmm. is effective. And that's my advice there. Awesome. So just based on your experience and what you've seen, obviously not as medical advice, taking into account that it's going to vary depending on how severe the case is, but just for an average, what amount of time does it typically take someone to heal their body? Not talking about the remediation they might need to do for their home, but just sure. as far as our body goes, like how long does it typically take someone to recover from mold toxicity? It definitely varies and there's different levels of recovery mm -hmm. from what I've seen. And so just to give you like an, 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 a nice anecdotal example, which is very positive. There's a woman that we worked with in Florida. She was actually living, living off of a feeding tube. Essentially it was the only way that she can get food to stay in her body. And within a week of moving out of that exposure, right? Just she, she got a place to, to live in, to get remediation done within a week of moving out of that exposure she was able to eat food again and was is able to remove the feeding tube. So that is a good testament to how quickly things can turn around. But in speaking to people, I've heard, you know, that it could take a year or, or more to fully recover, right? And so that's why there's stages. And what I'm looking at, like the, the science behind it, and again, I'm not a doctor, but I, 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 do, I do know how to read. And I'm reading through these medical journals, what I've seen is, you know, basically there's you have to do detoxifying on a gradient because detoxifying, what it does is it basically releases toxins from your fat cells that are causing these reactions, causing this inflammation. If you release too much at once, you actually go the reverse vector, right? You, you get sick all over again. You're experiencing these violent reactions. 
So you want to do it on a gradient scale so that you're releasing a little bit of toxins, open up these detoxifying pathways, removing them from your body, and then you go a stage deeper and kind of repeat that process. So it can be a journey. It can take a little bit, but not to say that, you know, you want to be discouraged because what happens is obviously, let's say every month you're getting better, you know, that's going to give you kind of that motivation to keep going because Mm -hmm. you're feeling, you know, you're feeling better as you, as you take each step. Mm -hmm. I have an acquaintance who, when you mentioned the lady who was on the feeding tube and recovered an acquaintance, she actually was exposed to mold. And so were her two children in their home. The children were having terrible nosebleeds and all this stuff and different symptoms. The husband had no symptoms whatsoever. So they decided to have a lot of remediation done. They went and moved into an apartment and they were doing all of this, the protocol to, you know, detoxify the mold and they still were not recovering. And then I guess someone, an expert like you, who, you know, finds mold and detects all this stuff come into their apartment. And I guess you can tell us more about how this works, but somehow they measured the amount of the spores that were maybe coming through the outlets in the wall. She explained it to me how they like held light and you could see that it's actually breathing all of the holes and stuff inside her house. And there was mold in the apartment that they went to, to get away from the mold in their home. So it was really unfortunate and a really huge setback for them because of this mold. But the way she described how they came in and searched for the mold was really interesting and fascinating to me. Can you tell us a little bit about how that mold that's inside of the walls or maybe in the crawl space, how does it even get into our home where we're living and breathing when we can't see it? Yeah, no, it's, it's a, you know, very good question. And just to, just to talk about the testing in in terms of the outlets, what they're doing is they're taking off the cover of the outlet. And when you have it, when you have a constructed home, you have all of these little interstitial areas where air can exchange from in in front of your wall to behind your wall. No house is hermetically sealed, nor should it be, because actually homes, we built with products that need to breathe. So you can't just seal it all shut or you'll create its own set of problems of trapped moisture. But basically you have mold behind a wall, unfortunately, because of all these interstitial cavities, it just comes right in to our living environment. And, you know, the crawl space is very interesting because 30% of the air that we breathe actually comes from the lowest point of our homes. And so crawl space typically is the lowest point. If you don't have a basement, you, you typically have a crawl space unless your house is built on slab. And so it's a place that is dark, damp, and you never check it, right? So perfect spot for mold to be hiding out and growing. And as that mold continues to grow and colonize, it produces what's called spores. Spores, the way I like to make this analogy is if you look at a weed, weeds produce seeds, seeds get aerosolized, They fall under the soil, it rains, water comes, it grows into more weeds. Mold is very similar because, you know, like the way I look at mold remediation, if you're just cut a weed off at its stem and leave the roots into the ground, it's just going to grow right back. Mold's exactly the same way. It has uh, root-like structures called hyphae, and they actually grow into the building materials. So that's why a lot of people, they're like, you know, I I cleaned the mold off my wall, but it came right back because you're basically just cutting it off at the stem, allowing the roots to stay. It's just going to come right back. So, you know, with these spores, they all produce spores. Again, that's how they transfer. So you may have mold in the crawl space and then you have a, a leak under your kitchen sink and that stays wet for 24 hours. The mold from your crawl space that's constantly circulated around your house now starts to grow new mold under your kitchen sink. That's kind of how this, this tends to work. Over the course of many years, you start to get, you know, basically contamination that creates all these sources all over the house. That also gets in your breathing zone and your body happens to be made up of mostly water. You didn't know that. So fungus is a problem basically in humans and animals alike. So, you know, that's, that's kind of how things work and how it gets into your body and how it impacts you. And, and basically there is a, an importance to how much, you know, like a source that's producing hundred spores per cubic meter is going to be very different than 100 million sports per cubic meter. You know, think about it. Too much of anything is no good for you, as they say. So the more volume you're having with each breath that you take, more impact it's going to have to the body. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if someone suspects, but they're not sure that maybe the symptoms they're experiencing 
may be connected to mold. What are some of the steps that you would recommend that they go through? Like, how do they start this process? Is this something that you outline in your book, the mold medic, or can you give us a little, maybe a little yeah. guidance? Yeah, it is. But I, I don't want to leave you guys here with, you know, read my book and you'll figure it out. You know, basically <laughs> the, 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 what you want to do is if you start having some reoccurring issues and something just doesn't feel right and you're looking at it like, well, did we have a hurricane recently or did I just move into a new place? That's that's a pretty good telltale sign that you're, you're dealing with an environmental exposure. But also things can happen over time that you're not aware of, such as a roof, you know, leak that occurs on the exterior side. So you don't actually see it from the interior side. But that's step one is I always rule out environmental exposures before you start doing all these surgeries and all these experimental procedures in the medical community, rule out environmental exposure first. That's my first piece of advice. The second thing is hire a good mold inspector uh, or, you know, environmental inspector. They come in many different names. There's indoor air quality professional, there's IEP, there's hygienist, you know, doesn't matter what terminology, they all pretty much are going to do a very similar thing, which is identify environmental exposures inside your home. You want to find someone that's going to really take their time. So I would, the first question I would ask a mold inspector is, hey, how long do you think this will take, you know, and try to get a sense? Because if they're like, ah, probably no more than an hour, you know, they may not be a right fit for you. So if you guys remember, if you've ever bought a home, you get like a home inspection report. Um, that person goes throughout the house for like two, three, sometimes even four hours, maybe even more to looking at every nook and cranny, trying to find all the possible outcomes, you know, that, that could be a problem when you buy the home. The mold inspector should really be similar. They should be going through every nook and cranny, looking for any signs of water intrusion, you know, environmental impacts like VOCs, you know, maybe, maybe there was a custom remodel done not too long ago, and there could be high levels of formaldehyde that could be triggering these. So you want to, you want to, you know, find someone who kind of, looks at the total picture and is going to spend the time to really look to see what the problems are. And then they'll take tests, which they then will send to the lab, will actually quantify everything, which is also important because, you know, a hundred spores versus a million spores is a very big difference. And I know the EPA on their website, it tells you they don't think that mold testing is, is really a necessity, you know, because all mold should be removed. But I think it actually is good to have data because let's say you have to be budget conscious, right? You don't want to just remove all of the mold, right? Because that may be a tall order. You have to know which types of molds are present and what the quantity is. So you know that you can bet that that's going to be the best bang for the buck, making sure I remove that. So I think the data, you know, I know I'm going against the EPA here, but I think the data itself is actually an intelligent decision because it's going to give you a lot more perspective to make decisions from. Right. Plus then, you know, kind of an order of priority, if you want, yeah. if you're able to attack the problem over a period of time, you know, what's the worst problem to start with and then work exactly. your way down the list. I, I, we definitely did that because doing yeah. it in stages was more affordable than doing it all at once, unless you're going to, totally. I mean, it depends, you know, if you've got a huge problem, then it could take uh, thousands of dollars to take care of it. So yeah, I agree with you. I think, you know, having that test, having those results really helps you know what you're exactly dealing with. So just wrapping up, I'm wondering, is there some basic tips that you give people for prevention? Like if, yes. you know, if they just want to be like, maybe they don't have any problems right now and they want to just be sure that they're doing all of the right things to try to prevent getting mold in the first place, or maybe I guess, does everyone have some amount of mold in their home or, and they just need to keep it under control? Okay. So, you know, there's, there, there's a lot that you can do. First off, you know, if, if you're a renter, obviously you're kind of limited in what you're allowed to change structurally to the building at that point, you know, as a renter, Keep the place really clean as best as you can, because what, what happens is all these contaminants, they actually get stored in the dust. So by removing the dust, you're removing a lot of contaminants. And the dust, even though you think like, ah, oh, it's on the floor, it's not entering my body. Actually, as the HVAC turns on, it's kind of recirculating it around. As you move through the room, it's enough, it actually changes the air pressure enough where it kicks it back up and gets in your breathing zone. So staying on top of cleaning is really important. 
I highly recommend investing into some sort of air, air purification device. The company that, that I like the best is IntelliPure, mainly because of its efficiency to get down to the smallest particle possible. And what's interesting about air purification systems, which I didn't know about this, but a lot of them are able to advertise on their filter efficiency based upon like testing it one time. So like, for instance, let's say your part, your, your efficiency can get down to as small as seven nanometers, right? If it gets it down, you know, to seven nanometers, 10% of the time, it's really only 10% efficient at seven nanometers. And believe it or not, that's all it takes for them, for them to say, oh, we can get down to seven nanometers. So it can be really tricky picking a, a good uh, air purification system because a lot of them are able to advertise off of a one-time occurrence rather than it's always efficient at this particle mm -hmm. size. So do some research when you're buying an air purification system because you want the best, the best thing you can ask for is the smaller the particle that it can crap into their filtration system the better because that's removing all these small particles from your air. And uh, we filter our water. So it's a good idea to filter our air too. It's less stuff that's gonna enter our body. If you own a home, the best thing to do would be to obviously maintain your home, which is an easy thing to say, harder thing to actually put into action. And I think the best action plan that you can come up with is probably doing like an annual inspection. So, you know, roofing, windows and doors, the, the, the exterior siding, facade, et cetera, those are the weak points. Um, also looking at the sloping and grading. If, you know, if it rains and everything is sloped towards the house, obviously this water is gonna come and beat against the house and eventually it does make its way in. So it's only mm -hmm. a matter of time. So paying attention to your sloping, grading, the exterior, doing an inspection to make sure, because unfortunately the second that a home is built, all it does is start to decay. So you gotta stay on top of that maintenance. Otherwise, you know, a couple hundred bucks and a repair could cost thousands of dollars later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned the sloping, because that's a thing that happens a lot here in Tennessee, where I live, there's a lot of Hills and a lot of neighborhoods. The yard is so steep. You can barely mow it. Oh, yeah. So we, that was exactly the problem we had with our one house that had mold is that the yard ran down to the house. So every time it rained, that water was going down towards our home and you know any little cracks or even just seeping under the ground gets it into the crawl space and then that's how it happens so it's really important to take a look at your house and just like through almost even just a common sense viewpoint what can be happening here where's moisture happening so really oh. really great tips i've really enjoyed talking to you michael i appreciate all of your advice Likewise. and help so tell us if someone wants to get in touch with you or find out more about what you do where do they find you two ways the moldmedic.com is, is a wealth of information regarding the book which kind of gives you the information of should i buy the book in the first place uh, also where to get it and then allamericanrestoration.com is a a really good resource the understanding, like, how do I find a good mold inspector? How do I find a good mold remediator? It is a service that we offer nationwide. So if you're not feeling well and you think you need someone who's a little bit more of a specialist in that regard, feel free to contact us. And then at Instagram and social media, I'm at the mold medic. So I, I do a ton of free information on there as well, giving you guys lots of good tips and things like that. So feel free to check it out and, and follow. And uh, I think you'll find some good information there. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate all of the useful information, tips, and advice you've given us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. Please rate and review so other people can learn about this podcast. Find out more about sleep, hygiene, eating healthy, tasty recipes, zero-waste lifestyle, and lots more on thatorganicmom.com. Help us spread the word. Be blessed and stay healthy.